took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers made a crown out of thorny branches and put it on his head. Then they put a purple robe on him and came to him and said, Long live the king of the Jews. And they went up and slapped him. Pilate went back out once more and said to the crowd, Look, I will bring him out here to you to let you see that I cannot find any reason to condemn him. Look, here is the man. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Crucify him! Crucify him! Take him then and crucify him. I find no reason to condemn him. We have a law that says he ought to die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back into the palace and asked Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus did not answer. He will not speak to me. Remember, I have the authority to set you free and also to have you crucified. You have authority over me only because it was given to you by God. So the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a worse sin. When Pilate heard this, he tried to find a way to set Jesus free. If you set him free, that means you are not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. If you set him free, that means you are not the emperor's friend. Anyone who claims to be a king is a rebel against the emperor. stone pavement. In Hebrew, the name is Gabbatha. It was then almost noon of the day before the Passover. Pilate said to the people, Here is your king. 
Do you want me to crucify your king? The only king we have is the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. Context is Christ was in a prayer meeting in a garden earlier that evening with his disciples on the previous day and he got arrested and hauled before two priests former high priest Annas and his son-in-law current high priest Caiaphas and accused for hours and now he's hauled before the Roman governor of that region Pilate's first business of the day they may have awakened him it was early in the morning and he has to deal with this mess so he questions Jesus he tells them he thinks he's innocent they still are upset and so in an effort to set him free, he says, Hey, uh, we have a custom of releasing a prisoner to you for the Passover to show goodwill on the side of the Roman government. Can I release to you the king of the Jews, this man? They said, No, give us Barabbas. So he then takes Jesus and beats him. His guards crown him with thorns. They slap him, mock him, and then he brings him out to them, and this still doesn't appease their anger. They still want him killed. He declares the fact he thinks he's innocent again. Then he brings Jesus back into his chambers and begins to talk with him, and Jesus is just silent. In verse 10 of John 19, Pilate says to Jesus, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? It's the word for authority, exousia. That's the word he uses. Jesus answered, verse 11, You could have no power or authority at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, we live in a world full of sinners who might actually sin against you, might actually commit an act of injustice against you. We have a promise. Romans 8.28 All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. For those He called, He foreknew. And those He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed to the image of His person. God is so awesome that even His enemies work for Him. So you don't have to stay awake at night worrying about who's scheming against you. God's got it under control. He has foreknowledge. He knows everything that's going to happen. There's a verse in Proverbs that says he made all things for himself, even the wicked, for the day of doom. It's as though the wicked are his firewood. He's going to use it for his purpose. And so here Pilate thinks, this guy should show me some respect. And Christ points out the fact, Pilate couldn't do anything unless God allowed it. That's faith. Totally trusting himself into the hand of his Father. I'd like to speak to you today on the topic, Jesus is faultless. Can we say that? Jesus is faultless. Now we know a fault is an error. It's something wrong with someone's character. It's a lack of integrity. It could be a crack in a vessel or a crack in the earth's crust. It's fault. Well, Christ has no faults. And yet, between us and God, before He came, there was a great fault. There was a break in our relationship. There was a short in the circuit. There was damage to be repaired. There was injustice to be remedied. And through what He did for us on the cross, He cured our fault. And just as He was declared to be faultless, through justification, we are made faultless through His righteousness being imputed to our case. 
Does it mean I don't have faults? No, it means in the eyes of God, He sees the finished product. He's not done working on me. Like an architect that creates plans for a building sees the finished product through His eyes of faith. So God, in relating to us, sees us as justified already and relates to us on that level. May God help us to do that with one another, that we not relate to each other through the eyes of the past, but through the eyes of the future, the eyes of faith. That is not Billy Bob on the front row, the ex-con. That's William Robert, the mighty man of God. Can I get an amen? There's some important observations I gather from this story that I'd like to share with you today. The first one is Jesus Christ was examined by two high priests and a governor. Now he's about to be offered up, unknown to them, as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. And under the old covenant law, when you brought a sacrifice, it was first examined by the priest. To be determined if it had faults. To be determined if it had blemishes or or was diseased or was crippled or was damaged in some way. It was not acceptable to offer to God a sacrifice that was not perfect. So your lamb had to be perfect. And so when it was deemed to be acceptable, then it was made sacrificeable. Christ had nothing they could pin on him. And Pilate officially declared him to be all free. They led him to Annas first, who was a fallen law of Caiaphas, who was high priest for that year. Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and Pilate went out to them. So three examiners examined this guy. And he's found to be faultless. Three times Pilate officially declared our Lord to be without fault. Verse 38 of chapter 18, he said, I find no fault in him at all. Verse 4 of the chapter 19, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you. He is bleeding. He's been beaten. He's got thorns on his head. He says, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no fault in him at all. We have just tortured an innocent man. Are you happy? Crucify him, crucify him. They wanted him destroyed. And in verse 6, he said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. He reminds them of his authority. You guys take him and crucify him. I don't find any fault in him. Well, they didn't have the authority to crucify him. That would put him in violation of Roman law. And being the legalists that they are, they wanted to do this thing as perfectly as they could. That's why they wouldn't walk into the praetorium. It was was a pagan structure, and it was graven images in there, and they didn't want to be ceremonially unclean for the Passover. And so they tried to do things as legally as they could. Meanwhile, they're putting to death an innocent man. They're revealing the ultimate sin, which is self-righteousness. I'm going to justify myself by my works and condemn you. God hates that kind of thing. The only real charge brought against Jesus was blasphemy. Jews told Pilate, we have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. There's a conversation recorded between Jesus and these guys in John chapter 10, and they're taking up stones. They want to kill him. Jesus said, why? Why? Which miracle is it? You know, was it the blind guy that pushed you over the edge? Or how about the crippled person? Well, why do you guys want to kill me? They said, not because of miracles, but because you've made yourself equal with God. Now here Jesus is. It's a catch-22 for him. Does he deny who he is and lie? That would be a sin, right? It's not pridefulness on his part to declare who he is. He's just stating facts, declaring who he is. And they're going to put him to death for it. Why? Well, based on Leviticus 24, there is this law that says, Whoever blasphemes in the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death by stoning. Some theologians believe that while Jesus was on the cross, they were throwing rocks at him to fulfill this law. The Bible doesn't say that. But based on this, if Christ was not the Son of God, 
then he was blaspheming to say that he was. It was a crime punishable by death. It was a capital sin. And so if these guys are not going to believe in him, then he's a blasphemer. But if he is who he says he is, then they are blaspheming for saying he's not who he is. You see, it's a setup. God inspired Moses to write the law to show us it's impossible for us to achieve perfection, to show to us we're just a bunch of sinners and we need a Savior. We need a sacrifice. We need expiation. We need compensation to be paid on our behalf before God. God, who inspired Moses to write the law, put this in there knowing it would lead to the death of his son by those in authority who refused to believe in Christ. Although not submitted, Pilate recognized him as a king. He said this more than once, calling him the king of the Jews. He even put it on a sign in several languages and put it on the cross, recognizing something was unique about this person. Now, some would say, oh, he did that to mock him, or he did that to mock the Jews. Really? Let's think. He says he's faultless. I find no fault. He has him crucified due to political pressure. You know, it reminds him of who he is. You want him crucified? You crucify him. Well, the Jews put it right back on him. You're not Caesar's friend if you show mercy to someone who says he's a king. Caesar wouldn't like this, which was true. Tiberius who was ruling at the time, was a paranoid maniac, quick to jump at any opportunity to wipe out a a would-be insurrectionist. and So Pilate had to look good in the eyes of his boss, and so they manipulated him into crucifying him. So being manipulated, would he try to mock the poor guy who's innocent, who's killing him? I think he believed there was something unique about Christ, and he recognized his authority. Number five, Jesus died in the place of a wicked person named Barabbas. Now, at the end of chapter 18, he reminds them, hey, I don't think he's at fault. I think he's innocent. I find no fault in him at all. We have a custom to release to you a prisoner for the Passover to show goodwill on the part of the Rome. Can I release him to you? You know, on the basis of that, let's let the man go free. They cry out, give us Barabbas. Now, he didn't offer them, hey, you want Barabbas or Jesus? He didn't want to release Barabbas. Barabbas was a bad guy. But he was a notorious criminal. They immediately knew who, knew who to ask for. So Christ's death was in the place of a wicked person. God allowed this to show us that the perfect sacrifice was sacrificed in the place of an imperfect person man. There's a movie about Barabbas. I don't know if there's any truth in it at all, but I think it's profound that the substitute for our sins, who came down so that we could go up, who came out so that we could go in, who became poor so that we might be made rich, who became sin so that we might be made righteous, became Barabbas so that Barabbas could go free. He paid the ransom of another man in paying our ransom. What a demonstration of the gospel. I wasn't here last Sunday because we went to Denver to visit our grandchild and daughter and son-in-law. And on the way back between here and Amarillo, I think maybe it was Claude, Texas, one of those West Texas towns, we stopped and got something to eat. And I went by the audio books shelf and found this book on audio, read by the author called The Year of Living Biblically. It's a book written by one of the editors at large of Esquire magazine. He's not a believer. He's a secular Jew, not a practicing Jew, who attempts to live biblically for a solid year. The first 242 days, he attempts to live by all 613 laws of the Old Testament. It's quite a humorous book of the contortions he goes through to do this. He winds up throwing pebbles at an adulterer and grows a beard that he can't trim. And he puts his wife through quite a stressful thing. So it's interesting. And then uh, from day 244 on, he's exploring Christianity. I haven't finished the book yet. But I discovered something in his search for applying the law. He wanted to offer animal sacrifices, and he kept running against a roadblock. The Jews tell him, well, we don't do that anymore. That will never happen until there's a temple, and then the ashes of the red heifer, and 
and all the complex legalities involved there. We found a stream of Judaism that offers up blood sacrifices once a year. It's called the Kaparot ceremony. Can we say Kaparot? The Kaparot ceremony is an offering of a chicken around Yom Kippur. There's a place near New York City where a truck full of chickens that are healthy, deemed to be fault-free, that are at this parking lot for a week, and this guy will sell you a chicken for 10 bucks. And so this stream of Hasidic Jews will show up, men and women, to buy a chicken. And they'll hold the chicken by both wings. Animal rights activists hate this. They, if you Google this, you'll find people decrying it, but it happens every year. They hold the chicken by two wings, and they pray a long prayer. And part of the prayer says, uh, Foolish sinners afflicted because of their sinful ways and their wrongdoings, they cry out to the Lord in their distress, and he saves them from their afflictions. And it goes on to say, If there could be an angel interceding out of a thousand accusers uh, to speak on our behalf, then God will be gracious to us and redeem us from going down to the grave. Well, we know who that is. Jesus, right? Then they wave the chicken in a circle over their head, hold it by the two wings like this, three times, and they say these words before the chicken is killed. They say, this is my exchange. This is my substitute. This is my expiation. Now, the word expiation means compensation for a wrong. Then they say, This chicken shall go to its death, and I shall proceed to a good and long life and shalom, peace. They then hand that sacrificial animal to a professional slaughterer who cuts its throat three times, and they hang it till all the blood is gone. Then they process it and give it to the poor. Will that preach or what? What Christ did for us, it points, it points to Jesus. He died in the place of wickedness as our substitute, as our expiation, as our exchange. And I could go a thousand directions from there preaching, but I won't. All right. Next point. According to Caiaphas' advice, Christ died for their nation. Look at this. In John chapter 11... They are being threatened by Jesus because he's upsetting their religious apple cart. Twice he has cleansed the temple of the den of thieves that he called it. You know, there was no place for Gentiles to go and worship because it was a marketplace. They would reject people's sacrifices and sell them a temple sacrifice of their one of their own and then recycle that one that was brought, take a trade in. They were making money off of this. And also, you were not allowed to use pagan money in the temple, so you had to use temple money, so there was an exorbitant exchange rate. These guys were millionaires, and so they were upset. And they're saying, this is going to destroy our nation. And Caiaphas said, in light of those thoughts, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. It's better for one man to die than for the whole nation to die. Not realizing how profound that is, John remembers it and records it and reviews it again in chapter 18, verse 14. He said, this is the Caiaphas that advised it was expedient that one man should die for the people. These are edicts or decrees from religious authorities that are just profound. How God is at work using faulty men to bring a remedy to our faults. Next point. A reason for his unjust death was the rejecting of his authority. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. They just sinned. They weren't supposed to say that. God was their king. We have no king but Caesar. You remember when they first got Saul as the king? Samuel was grieved in Israel's history. They were ruled by judges. 
And the Israelites wanted to be like all the other nations of the world and have one person to represent them. Give us a king. And Samuel was so grieved, and God spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So here they are, rejecting the Son of God, their king, and embracing Tiberius, one of the most wicked rulers in the world at that time. Talk about rejecting and accepting. So if you reject God's will for your life and embrace a sin, you don't know where that sin's going to take you. It'll take you further than you planned on going, keep you longer than you planned on staying, and cost you more than you planned on spending. Don't give a foothold to the enemy. We have no king but Caesar. So this whole process has exposed sin in their hearts. Ultimately, the Lord was crucified because of unbelief. Because they didn't believe he was the Son of God, they believed he was blasphemy. So what sin nailed Jesus to the cross? You could say blasphemy, or you could say unbelief. Determine how you look at it. He being who he said he was, was not blaspheming. They were blaspheming, and it was their unbelief that caused them to do that. John 3.16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now this is the begotten son saying this that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The previous verse said that as Moses hung the serpent up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be hung up or lifted up, so that whoever believes in him would not perish. He goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. Now, the world is condemned. If you don't believe it, read the news. Watch the news. Google the news. It's full of wickedness. Mankind has given themselves over to sin. And look at the results. With all of our money, all of our education, all of our technology, it just gets worse. And you can point the finger at something, and what's going to fix it? We can blame all our nation's problems on guns. Take them away, and what do you get? Look at Mexico. There you got it. It's illegal to have a gun there. We have a Marine there in jail for having a gun with him. Do you want to live there? It's a pretty dangerous nation. So anyway, the world's been given over to sin. So the world's already condemned. We in the world are incarcerated by wickedness. God in his love made a way out by bridging the gap, fixing the fault, repairing the short, remedying the injustice on the cross. So you want out? It's through Jesus. Well, I don't know if I can believe in a God who's allowed such wickedness in the world. Well, believe this. Believe in a God that allows mankind to go this way. He didn't make us to be robots. And look at what we've got. Make us religious and it just magnifies our faults. The way out is through Jesus. I'm not talking about church membership as much as I believe in the church. I'm employed by a church. It's through Jesus. Church membership will not get you out of your incarceration. Only Christ. Through Him we receive the substituted life, the exchanged life, the expiated remedy for our errors. Doris Rosser Jr. and Ellen Vaughn have written a book called The God Who Hung on the Cross. Chuck Colson wrote the foreword to it. And in this book is a story that has given the book the title. Journalist Ellen Vaughn retells a gripping story of how the gospel came to a small village in Cambodia. In September of 99, a Cambodian pastor traveled to Kampong Tom province in northern Cambodia. Throughout that isolated area, Christianity was virtually unheard of. 
But when he arrived in one small rural village, the people warmly embraced him and his message about Jesus. It's like they were waiting for him. And this stood out from all the surrounding villages as to the reception to the gospel. He asked them about their openness. And an old woman shuffled forward, bowed, and grasped his hands as she said, We have been waiting for you for 20 years. Now keep in mind, this is at September of 99. And she told him the story of the mysterious God who hung on the cross. In the 1970s, the Khmer Rouge slaughtered hundreds of thousands of Cambodians, destroying everything in its path, wiping out populations of entire regions and villages. And when they descended upon this little village in northern Cambodia in 79, they, as usual, rounded up all the villagers and forced them to dig their own graves. After they had finished digging, they prepared themselves to die, facing their graves, the gunmen behind them. Some screamed to Buddha, others screamed to demon spirits or to their ancestors. One of the women started to cry for help based on a childhood memory, a story her mother had told her about a God she had heard about who had hung on a cross. The woman prayed to that unknown God on a cross. Surely, if this God had known suffering, he would have compassion on their plight. Suddenly, her solitary cry became one great wail as the entire village started praying to the God who had suffered and hung on a cross. As they continued facing their own graves, the wailing slowly turned to a quiet crying. There was an eerie silence in the muggy jungle air, and slowly they began to dare to turn around and face their captors and discovered the soldiers from Khmer Rouge were all gone. As the old woman finished telling the story, she told the Cambodian pastor that ever since that humid day 20 years ago, the villagers had been waiting, waiting for someone to come and share the rest of the story about the God. Lord, we thank you for all the beautiful truths that we get from the story leading up to your crucifixion. Lord, we thank you that you know what suffering is. You know what hurting is. You know what betrayal and slander feels like. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here walking through a season of that kind of stuff, as painful as it is, Lord, may they know they're not alone. May they know that there's a Savior, a compassionate high priest that they can cry out to who understands, who can give them grace and strength to help in their time of need. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who knows they're separated from you, that they've been part of the incarcerated wickedness of the world of just being away from you. Even though they're a good person, Lord, there's something missing. I pray, Lord, that they would open their heart up to the reality of believing in you and be free from the penalty for their sins and brought into your family. Lord, we declare today that you are fallless and we are not. We ask you to begin to heal our faults through your faultlessness. Remedy our lack of integrity with your imputed righteousness. We receive your perfections by faith. Jesus' name. Amen. People in the back. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to celebrate your shed blood and your broken body. We pray, Lord, that what you did for us would be made so real. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this day, for this opportunity, Lord, to recognize what Jesus has done for us in this time of communion. 
Father, your word says that when we receive the bread, we receive the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ is healing and deliverance. Father, we thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. We receive his body today, and we believe by faith that as we take it, we receive his healing, we receive his deliverance, we receive his salvation, we receive everything that he died on the cross for us to have. We receive it by faith today in Jesus' name. By your brokenness, Lord, we declare we are made whole. God, you are so good to us. You've given us the perfect sacrifice to cover all sin. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for he was beaten and his blood was shed for us so that we can commune with you. Father, we now take this cup, the blood of Christ, in Jesus' name. Jesus shed